A very warm welcome and good afternoon to uh, this session on uh, interesting cases in comprehensive ophthalmology. So I'm sure uh, that this session will be interactive and if there are any doubts, then we can, uh, you know, ask the presenters at the end of the presentation. So without further delay, uh, we should, I think we'll just start, go ahead with the session. So again, a very good afternoon. I'm very thankful to AIOS for giving me this opportunity. So I'll be presenting uh, three cases, so relatively simple cases with straightforward uh, diagnosis and management, only that the uh, outcome was not very, very favorable. Despite everything, uh, the outcome was not favorable and that is why I thought I'll present it here. And if the expert panel can offer some suggestions as to what alternatives you could have had. So my case first, uh, the first case is an 82 year female patient who complained of diminution of vision in the right eye for one month. She was a VIP patient. She was the uh, wife of an ex-politician. And uh, she had come to me for after some recommendation. So it was a high profile case. She was a known hypertensive for 10 years, controlled with medications. There was no cardiac history, no history of fever, and no COVID history. So this is the fundus picture of the right eye. Uh, the vision was quite poor, counting finger two meters. And all I could make out was uh, a slight dilatation and tortuosity of the retinal vessels and few blot hemorrhages in the macula. Left eye vision was 6 by 18. So this is the OCT picture of the right eye, which showed uh, a massive subretinal fluid and uh, convoluted uh, inner retinal layers, uh, along with outer retinal layers. Uh, I made a diagnosis of uh, macular BRVO in this uh, uh, case, and I gave the patient injection. I gave the patient injection eccentrics in the right eye. This is the left eye picture, which was normal. The OCT was also normal. To my dismay, when the patient came after 15 days, uh, there was a large clump of cotton wool spots in the peripapillary area in the macula. And now, the uh, blot hemorrhages had appeared in the, throughout the fundus, resembling an ischemic CRVO kind of picture. Though on OCT, the edema had disappeared, but uh, the patient was very unhappy because the vision had not improved. Uh, at this stage, I did an FFA, which showed uh, uh, some blot, uh, 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 you know, so some uh, uh, patchy hypofluorescent uh, spots, as well as leakage from the capillaries. And if you see clo closely in the inferotemporal arcade, there was this, there was this non-perfused vessel. The o OCTA was also not very, uh, uh, you know, indicative of a lot of ischemia because. Uh, because uh, uh, there was a little bit of patchy dropouts, but not gross ischemia. And this is the left eye picture, which was absolutely normal. So uh, at this stage, I also did a peripheral blood smear, which was uh, uh, normal. A carotid Doppler was normal. Patient was started on systemic steroids after consultation with physician. And this is the picture after uh, two months when the vision had improved marginally to six, uh, six by 60, the cotton wool spots had disappeared a little, but and the foveal contour was normal, but the vision was not great. Then she went to Delhi and she received two more injection uh, eccentric uh, injections, but uh, still the vision did not improve. So in differential diagnosis, uh, what could it be? It, was it post fever retinitis? Was it viral retinitis? Ischemic CRVO was most likely picture, uh, considering that the uh, vision was very poor. And, but why was there no visual recovery after anti of injection? Was it CRVO, but there were no cherry red spot or macular whitening, and there was no gross macular ischemia on FFA or OCTA. Case 2 was a 65-year male patient, hypertensive on treatment. There was no history of hyperlipidemia. There was no cardiac history. There was no history of diabetes. Vision in the right eye was counting finger 3 meter, and you can see this uh, blood and tender appearance of the fundus with the uh, cotton wool spots and vas vascular tortuosity. The corresponding OCT, uh, just note how massive the subretinal fluid is in the right eye. And then the diagnosis was obvious. I gave her uh, anti of injection. But after two injections of uh, eccentrics, you can see that in the macular area, uh, a thin uh, fibrin-like, uh, uh, ring-like exudate had, uh, had accumulated. And because of this, the vision was not very, uh, uh, you know, it was not very favorable. And you can see that the edema had disappeared, the foveal contour was normal, but because of this ring-like deposit of fibrin, the vision was not very good. And this is, is the left eye. Going on to case 3, 55-year female patient, known hypertensive, history of ischemic heart disease 3 years ago, no history of diabetes. She 
she was uh, her ldl was increased and she was on lipras this is the right eye picture and the right eye fundus on oct the left eye you see uh, blood and thunder appearance of the fundus some uh, pre retinal hemorrhage in the along the inferior uh, uh, temporal quadrant and uh, if you see closely there were also sclerosed vessels in the in inferior uh, uh, temporal quadrant as well as uh, superior to the disc and this was the oct which showed uh, 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 retinal inflammation it showed uh, intra retinal uh, fluid cysts it showed sub retinal fluid but uh, to my dismay after uh, uh, injection eccentrics when the patient came after one month uh, there were a lot of these hard exuded clumps which had uh, which had occurred in the macular area which had got deposited which were not there earlier and because of this the vision was uh, it had actually decreased by one line so from 660 it became counting finger 3 meters and there was also the sclerosis of the vessels as i could make out inferiorly but uh, because of these exudates the vision was very poor this is the red free picture and see on the oct the fluid has disappeared but the exudates have appeared so there was an in interesting article uh, which i came across in bmc ophthalmology which said that aggravation of the retinal hard exudates after intravitreal uh, in injections for cystoid macular edema uh, was studied and uh, the, they had studied cases of uh, dr as well as brvo and they said that cme with subretinal fluid is associated with a higher risk of hard exudate progression and the two um, uh, important factors that they mentioned was lo the long duration of cme and the high ldl levels ident identified as risk factors for hard exudate progression following anti vegf treatment in their cases acute brvo cases did better than dr cases so uh, points for discussion is we all know that in ischemic crvo in the first hand uh, picture we don't need to do an ffa but considering my cases do you think that ffa is mandatory for all cases of ischemic crvo should octa be considered in all cases before giving anti vegf yes. and predictors if any of the occurrence of hard exudates following anti vegf injection and what precautions we can take for the same thank you so much for your patient hearing Thank you, Dr. Sinha. Well, uh, myself, Dr. Indramani Dastogi, Dr. Sabesati Patnaik, and Dr. Rajan Rajan Anand. So, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Any questions? No, no. Any thank questions you. From audience? No. We know for sure that when the fluid uh, de uh, decreases very rapidly, when there's a lot of fluid and it decreases very rapidly after giving anti-vegf injections, sometimes these hard exudates appear. Uh, subfovially and that causes loss of vision but how do we predict that how do we know that this patient will have this problem so i think this article helped me because if the patient has altered lipid levels and if the, if the long uh, cme is long standing then you have to be very careful you have to have a vigil and you have to warn the patient that look this is what can ha happen so this is the take home message that i think i gathered from my case and then the second part is we should do it for spontaneous resolution as it was the conventional teaching before eh? Yes. Because previously also it was considered that for three months or six months we have to wait in BRVO and macular edema, and most of the time the edema resolves and the vision improves. So perhaps that holds good. Also. But the vision, uh, the presenting vision was very poor, sir, already. That so that is why nowadays we don't wait for uh, spontaneous spontaneous resolution to the tune of three months correct, because your presentation, I mean, in spite of giving anti-VEGF injections, then there is chances <laughs> of uh, hard exudates coming up. and we do not know the origin of that had a that's true sir but in all cases this doesn't happen yeah. so that is the thing and the other thing is that uh, sometimes what happens is that the cme is long standing but patient doesn't come to know of it so we don't how we can cannot quantify that when it appeared okay thank you thank you dr thank Sena. you so much thanks for a very nice presentation so next speaker dr gautam kumar good afternoon everyone sab khatam hota ja raha hai this is very interesting case of ross syndrome as uh, we know the tonic pupil is a neurological disorder in which one or both pupil are abnormally dilated with delayed constriction in response to the exposure to the light 
and there is a female preponderance. There is two type of tonic pupil. One is the Holmes AD syndrome and second is the Ross syndrome. In Holmes AD syndrome, there is tonic pupil with areflexia of acalis muscles involving knee joint or ankle joint. In Ross syndrome, there is triad of tonic pupil, segmental anhydrosis or hypohydrosis with areflexia. Usually causes are idiopathic, but it may be due to the neurotrophic viral infection, eye trauma during peribulbar injection or ischemic, ischemic causes. This eye trauma and viral infections and ischemia leads to the inflammations and damage to the neurons in the ciliary ganglion and dorsal root ganglion. Many factors like autonomic denervations, autoimmunity, developmental origin, viral infection and genetic factors may be attributed in the pathogenesis of Ross syndrome. The aim of the case report. As the Ross syndrome is very uncommon uh, disorder, only few cases have been reported till date, only 50. So our aim was to share this uncommon interesting case on this forum. A 35 years female presented to outpatient department of ophthalmology, PMC Patna, with defective vision for distance in near since few months from the left eye. And there was also associated pain in the right foot at second two and recurrent knee joint pain in right leg. And there was also history of lack of sweating on right side of back and right side of the face. And there was no history of trauma, diabetes, hypertension. Patient was non-smoker, non-alcoholic housewife. On examination in right eye, vision was 66 and left eye was 624. And BCBA uh, was 6 by 9 partial. Near vision, N6 and right eye. Left eye was N36. Ocular movement was uh, full and free in all cardinal gadgets. IOP was within normal limit. On pupillary examinations, the right eye pupil was normal size, left eye was dilated, and there was delayed constriction on exposure to the torch light. This was also followed by the delayed dilatation observed on the swinging light test. On pilocarpine test with the diluted low dose pilocarpine, one by uh, eight times, pupil was constricted with the low dose pilocarpine due to supersensitivity to the cholinergic innervation. Normally, pupil does not constrict with the dilu diluted pilocarpine. Thus, diagnosis of tonic pupil was confirmed. Um, on slit, uh, slit lamp examination, anterior segment was within normal limit, fundus was within normal limit. On nervous system examinations, ankle, was, ankle jerk was sluggish in right leg, and skin of face and back appears to be dry and scaly. On investigations, total hemogram was within normal limit, blood sugar normal, thyroid function test was normal, MRI brain and cervical spine was showing no any abnormalities. So differential diagnosis, there are two strong differential diagnoses, that is Ross syndrome and Holmes AD syndrome. Other differentials were the Horner syndrome, hereditary sensory autonomic neuropathy. Patient was referred to neuromedicine department for further opinion. Neuromedicine physician also was in opinion of, uh, in favor of diagnosis of Ross syndrome. Discussion. Ross syndrome is characterized by a triad of tonic pupil, hyporeflexia, and segmental anhydrosis or hypohydrosis. In 1958, this syndrome was first described by the Dr. Ross. Anhydrosis and tonic pupil is due to involvement of postgaluminic fiber of iris and sweet gland, but causes of areflexia are due to the impaired spinal monosynaptic connection. Segmental anhydrosis is also present in multiple sclerosis, diabetes, leprosis, Sjogren's disease. Usually, tonic pupil is unilateral, but may involve other eye also. In the tonic pupil, reactions to light is more impaired compared to the accommodation. And there is a light near dissociation. With progression of time, partial recovery and accommodation is observed. De uh, defect in of areflexia is permanent and there is no chances of recovery. And in Ross syndrome, there may be compensatory hypohydrosis. These are differences. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Any questions from audience? Okay, thank you. Next. If the pupil is dilated and it is not reacting, right? Delayed, uh, delayed is it reactive, not uh, dilated and fixed, sir. It it's is not dilated and fixed. There is a delayed constriction. Okay. So why do, we, light why do we call it tonic and not atonic? The, a, ton, the tonic means that the uh, pupil is dilated and that is not, uh, only there is delayed direct constriction, uh, delayed direct uh, constriction. 
and pupil is normally the pupil constricts after uh, removal the light it normal to size but in this case pupil is not uh, coming back no i mean uh, how will you differentiate uh, how will you label a pupil atonic and tonic <laughs> Can I have the privilege to uh, call upon Dr. Prakash Kumar Keshav? A very warm good afternoon to all the respected seniors. And first of all, I would like to thank AIUS for giving me the, this opportunity to uh, present a case, a rare case of five siblings with warden work syndrome. Uh, myself, Dr. Prakash Kumar Keshav from JLNMCH Bhagalpur. Disclosure, no financial interest. A 19-year-old female admitted in medicine department having complaint of pain abdomen and vomiting episodes. She has villous vomiting and heterochromia aridis since birth. On examination, she also had freckles over face and dental discoloration since birth. On local ocular examination, except heterochromia aridis, other ocular findings were normal. Her two elder sisters have blue eyes and black eyes respectively. Her younger sister, who died last year due to kidney failure, also had heterochromia aridis. And her elder brother have blue eyes like his father and grandfather and is completely deep, deep and mute. Her other extraocular findings were within normal limit. These are his, uh, these are his, these are her uh, sit lamp examination pictures. Now, warden work syndrome is basically of four types. Type one is associated with PAX3 gene mutation. PAC, uh, type two is with MITF gene mutation. Type three is an extreme presentation of type one, and type four warden work syndrome is associated with Hersprung disease. It is also known as Sah warden work syndrome. It is associated with endothelin, endothelin three gene mutation. All these forms show marked variability even within families, and at present, it is not possible to predict the severity even when a mutation is detected. Now, diagnostic criteria for um, W1 have been proposed by the Warden Work consorti Consortium. In brief, to be counted as B affected, a person must have two major or one major plus two minor criteria. In major criteria, congenital sensory neural hearing loss and pigmentary disturbances like heterochromia iridium, partial or segmental heterochromia, hypoplastic blue eyes, and hair hypopigmentation like uh, that is white forelock. Other major uh, criteria are dystopia cantorium and affected first degree relatives. In minor criteria, congenital leukoderma, uh, synorphis, broad and high nasal root, hypoplasia of Alanazi, premature graying of hair is considered. For WS syndrome, uh, Wardenburg syndrome 2, uh, in major criteria, there is exclusion of dystop dystopia cantorium and inclusion of premature graying. And one major difference is that two major features should be present for the diagnosis of Borden work syndrome 2. Now, it, uh, it is a uh, rare auditory pigmentary syndrome caused by physical absence of melanocytes from the skin, hair, eyes, or the stria vascularis of the cochlea. Dominantly inherited examples with patchy dis dis uh, depigmentation are usually labeled Borden work syndrome, like in our case among the five siblings. Severity of these siblings varies from completely normal to one dead with heterochromia iridium. So severity can't be predicted, but tendency can be commented as case with heterochromia iridis has bad prognosis. The mechanism is less certain that how it occurs, but it appears that haploinsufficiency is a major factor in producing the relatively, re relatively mild abnormalities of Wardenburg syndrome. Among heterozygous mutations, carriers may also be found and Wardenburg syndrome 1 and 4 are now well-defined genetic entities, while the label uh, Wardenburg syndrome 3 is largely redundant. Wardenburg syndrome 2 remains a heterogeneous mix. We can offer families an explanation of why they have Wardenburg syndrome, but we are still unable to predict what features of Wardenburg syndrome 
like uh, what mutation are there, but we can't uh, uh, predict how will it appear. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the audience? Dr. Rajan, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, dear. So, uh, next speaker is Dr. Rahul Goginani. Dr. Rahul is there. Please come forward. Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, I'm Dr. Rahul Goginini, second year postgraduate, and uh, it's an honor to be presenting on this stage. So my topic is uh, muscle transplantation cures, adult onset, committent, large exotropia with diplopia which is an infrequent entity corrected by novel surgery. So large angle alternate exotropia is exotropia with more than 70 to 75 prism diopters of deviation. And the finding of diplopia associated is a rare finding, but it was seen in this case. So a 31 year old uh, male patient presented to our department uh, with outward on and off deviation of right eye since 15 years. And he complained of diplopia since two years, which worsened since past seven months. And uh, the diplopia is binocular in nature and nocturnal variation was not seen. He had trauma to his uh, uh, right-sided forehead 16 years ago. So these were his photographs at age 7, 27 and uh, at the time of presentation. So he had a history of spectacle usage for a uh, few months and he discontinued. Immunization history, developmental history and family history were not significant. Uh, he presented with uh, CHP of uh, right-sided face turn and his facial symmetry was not disturbed. Ocular symmetry was disturbed due to outward deviation of right eye. His, uh, on his work corneal reflex test, uh, 45 degrees exotropia were present on near and far. On covering the left eye, we could observe uh, inward deviation of right eye. On alternate cover test, both eyes moved briskly inwards. On prism bar cover test, for near and far, we observed 85 prism diopters base inwards in front of right eye and central in front of left eye. Uh, the versions and duction movements were full and free in both eyes. On worth 4 dot testing and diplopia charting, we observed uh, paradoxical diplopia. Since it's an exotropia, uh, the diplopia out here, it's uncrossed diplopia, so we observed uh, paradoxically. Vision was uh, 6 by 6 in both eyes and uh, anterior segment findings were normal and fundus was within normal limits. Investigations were within normal limits. Uh, you can observe here the pre-op photographs on all nine gazes, he had full and free movements. So we performed uh, uh, muscle transplantation surgery, uh, right eye 11 mm lateral rectus resection and 7 mm medial rectus resection. So let me just show you this video. So in this procedure, the lateral rectus is hooked and uh, it's isolated with a limbus-based incision and uh, intermuscular septum is cut and a 5-0 double ethibond whip stitch suture is applied to the lateral rectus muscle. The medial rectus is now separated with a limbal-based incision and a 6-0 vicryl is passed through the tendinous insertion of the medial rectus muscle. And another 6-0 vicryl suture is then uh, placed as per standard dissection procedure and it is sutured to the sclera following the spiral of tilo and then the muscle is cut. Now the resected part is transplanted to the lateral rectus muscle. This is the resected part now. It will be transplanted to the lateral rectus muscle and its uh, distal end is united with the 5-0 ethibond suture. The proximal end of the resected part is anchored to sclera by a 6-0 vicryl and uh, thus the whole resected piece acts as a biological spacer.
So uh, on uh, post-operative nodes, uh, we observed both eyes, HCRT was central. You can observe this on post-operative day one. Uh, following treatment was given, antibiotics and steroids. So uh, post-operative day one week, day seven. Fortunately, within one to two weeks, uh, patient uh, uh, responded well and uh, he uh, complaints of diplopia also resolved in the patient. So on conclusion, uh, the adult onset exotropia associated with uh, paradoxical diplopia was resolved in this patient with muscle transplantation surgery, which is a novel procedure. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Fixism, fixism in the both the eyes. Sir, uh, uh, he had a 75 degree exotropia, sir. No, it Alternate was exotropia. Right, but vipobial fixism was there or not? Sir? Was there any abnormal retinal correspondence, ARC, or vipobial fixism? No, sir. No, sir. So fixism was vipobial in both the eyes? Yes, sir. So why that is to be tested? Otherwise, after correction also, you will have diplopia. Yes. Any, any references in the literature? Sir, I refer to a uh, uh, few, two articles, sir, mm. uh, by Dr. Sonali Rao and uh, uh, Dr. Jetani. They perform muscle transplantation surgery and… Uh, in RVP only? In… in uh, these were IJO articles, sir. Not sure where they perform. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, it they was in Karnataka, it. sir. Karnataka. Yeah. No, no. They, they did it in uh, LVP only. Yes. What do you think the cause of this acquired exotropia? Sir, uh, patient actually presented since uh, since 15 years. It was he was under it. It was, uh, might be uh, intermittent exotropia, and then uh, slowly it progressed because the exotropia is intermittent exotropia. It may resolve or it may progress towards uh, constant exotropia also. So only cannot progress to 75 degrees. Sir, we can, uh, and it is uh, quite a rare case, sir. As you have observed, I have shown you photographs also at different ages, age groups. Uh, let me show you again, sir, if you want. No, no, not, not, thank you. Yeah. How many more cases have you done? Sir? How many more cases have, has been done? Sir, actually, this is my thesis topic, sir. As far as, until now, I have gotten uh, around 16 to 17 cases uh, of alternate exotropia, but uh, none of them presented with uh, diplopia, sir. So, we found this as a special case, so I wanted to present it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Nice presentation. Thank you, sir. Usually, alternate exotropias are the favorable cases for such. Yes. Thank you, sir. So, next speaker on the dais is Dr. Tanya Yadav. Which college is IMS, SMS? Sir, uh, some hospital, Bhuvaneshwar. Bhuvaneshwar? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, teachers. I'm presenting a case report of lacrimal sac diverticulum simulating as chronic dacrocystitis. It is a rare condition characterized by a cystic protruded pouch which communicates with the lacrimal sac. It may be congenital or acquired. The acquired case is most commonly seen after trauma or inflammation. The most common location is at the junction of the lacrimal sac and the nasolacrimal duct and in the lateral wall of the lacrimal sac. The patients are commonly asymptomatic but can present with a long-standing palpable mass, epiphora, discharge. The case is of a 37 years old female, resident of Odessa, housewife, with chief complaints of swelling near the left medial canthus since two years and watering and discharge from left eye since six months. Patient was apparently asymptomatic two years ago. Then she developed swelling near the left medial canthus, which gradually increased in size and was associated with occasional pain. Six months ago, she developed watering and discharge from left eye, which was mucoid in nature. There's no history of trauma or surgery, redness, or any visual disturbance. Past history and drug history were not relevant. All the vitals were within normal limits. All the systemic examination were within normal limits. On local examination, the head position was erect. There was no facial asymmetry. A swelling was present on the medial aspect of the left lower eyelid. It was of size one multiplied by one centimeter, moderately tense in consistency, reducible on giving pressure, immobile, and the overlying skin was normal. 
Best corrected visual acuity in both the eyes was 66 and N6. Roplas test on right side was negative. On the left side, on pressing the swelling, a mucoid fluid came out from the nasal cavity. Anterior and posterior segment were within normal limit in both the eyes. Lacrimal pa passage was patent in both the eyes, but there was an enhancement of swelling while syringing on the left side. On probing, there was a hard stop on left side. We came to a provisional diagnosis of lacrimal sac diverticulum on the left side, and the differential diagnosis were lacrimal pump failure, epidermoid cyst of inferior nasal part of orbit, chronic dacrocystitis, uh, dacrocystitis with mucosal. All the blood investigations were within normal limit. On CT orbit and PNS, a tubular soft tissue lesion, size 10 multiplied by 6 millimeter, with surrounding fat stranding in the left lacrimal sac, suggestive of lacrimal sac diverticulum was found. On dacrocystography, a small contrast fill opacified diverticulum with the communication to the left lacrimal sac was noted. We finally made the diagnosis of left lacrimal sac diverticulum. Based on the findings of dacrocystography, we performed diverticulectomy under local anesthesia. Lacrimal sac patency was maintained before and after the surgery. A diverticulum of size 0.5 multiplied by 0.4 centimeter was excised and was sent for biopsy. On histopathology of the specimen, on h &E staining under 40x magnification, the section showed flattened cuboidal epithelial lining suggestive of the lacrimal sac. Under 100x magnification, fibrocollagenous tissue with skeletal muscle bundle along the lining of the sac was found. The patient was followed up for six months and the lacrimal passage was patent in all the visits. These are uncommonly diagnosed clinical abnormality of the sac Milano et al. reported 3% cases with diverticulum out of 2,000 dacrocystographies done for lacrimal obstruction. Usually, a diverticulum occurs as an outpouch from the lateral wall of the lacrimal sac or has a communication with the later. In our case, a small communication was present between the sac and the diverticulum, so the patient underwent diverticulectomy. It is a rare condition. Dacrocystography is the most useful in diagnosis. CT has a limited value. Management includes surgical excision of the diverticulum or dacrocystorhinostomy. With proper clinical evaluation and investigation, we can preserve the lacrimal passage of the patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tanya Yadu. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. Thank you. So next speaker is Dr. Ramesh Chandra Kumar. <laughs> Next is Dr. Sushil Kumar B. Reddy. Dr. Sushil Kumar is there. And Dr. Gajal Patnaik. Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Ramesh Chandrakumar from PMCH Patna, and today I'm going to discuss a case on acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. There is no financial interest. Uh, there was a two-year-old boy who presented with the complaint of sudden onset of pain, redness, itching, watering, lead swelling in his left eye from three days, and redness discharge in left eye from one day. He had a similar history of uh, symptoms in his right eye three days back, and th there was no any associated history of any trauma, foreign body, fever, diarrhea. Patient consulted with the local ophthalmologist where, they, where he treated with uh, antibiotic eye drop and eye ointment, and then the patient came to PMCH IOPD with the presenting complaints. There was no any relevant family history. On general examination, patient was well oriented to with time, place, person, and his weight, temperature, pulse, BP was, were normal. There was no any abnormality could be detected on systemic examination. On ocular examination, his patient was responded to bright light and follows the target. His eyelids are matted with the discharge and lead were slowly. Conjectiva 
congested with uh, follicles and subconjunctival hemorrhage, cornea was clear, and pupil was reactive to light, and lens was clear. Fluorescent staining was negative in both his eyes, and fundus examination comes within normal limit in both the eyes. These are some pictures of the patient with the mild lead swelling, uh, conjunctival congestion, uh, for subconjunctival hemorrhage. Patient were advised for RT-PCR for a virus isolation. And uh, on the basis of the above clinical investigative finding, uh, a provisional diagnosis of acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis was made. DD can be bacterial conjunctivitis, allergic conjunctivitis, or vital trauma. Uh, patient were given symptomatic treatment. Uh, patient prescribed with the antibiotic eye drop ointment, decongestant, and lubricant eye drop. They also, uh, patient was also advised with cold compression and to maintain proper hygiene and also advised to follow up after one week. These are some pictures of the patient improved symptomatically within 10 days of visual presentation. Humans are the sole host for the enterovirus. Virus spreads easily through fecal oral channels. The rates of the AS acute hemorrhagic conjunctivitis infection are highest where unhygienic practice is there. Spreads can occur between mother and child. Management consists of symptomatic treatment while disease runs its course for five to seven days. ASC almost always resolves without sequelae, having a good visual prognosis. However, corneal microbial superinfection has been reported after treatment with topical steroids and it requires appropriate antimicrobial therapy. These are my references. Thank you. So why you prescribed antibiotics? So uh, to uh, prevent uh, secondary uh, bacterial infection, sir. Why do we expect secondary in this case? Uh, if the diagnosis is pure acute hemorrhagic yes. because of the retrovirus. Yes, sir. And it cleared within 10 days. Yes, sir. Any questions from audience? Do you think it is an unusual case? Sir, we have never seen it. Is it a very unusual case? I don't think so. Yeah. I have never seen that case. Why did you say I don't know. My, um, <coughs> my, my seniors were told me to present that case. Ma'am is asking what is the clinical importance attached to this uh, case you have particularly present? What message you are to So my seniors will uh, told me that. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, dear. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Sushil. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Sushil Kumar, Dr. Gajal, Dr. Gajal Patnaik. So this is the last topic of this session. A very good afternoon to everyone, respected panel. So we are discussing about challenging cases in comprehensive ophthalmology. I shall be presenting a challenging case of exudative retinal detachment. And we'll see how these are uh, so challenging in all the respects of diagnosis, investigation, and management. So to begin with the case, it's a case of a 32-year-old male with diminution of vision in the left eye since two weeks. He said he had headache and tinnitus on the simultaneous onset. The best corrected visual acuity was 2020 in the right eye and 2080 in the left eye. Uh, the intraocular pressure and the slit lamp by microscopy was within normal limits in both the eyes. And fundoscopy revealed presence of a 360 degree choroidal detachment with retinal detachment in the inferior quadrant of the left eye, as can be seen in the fundus photograph and the B scan here. There was an increased choroidal thickness as well. So, and fundal uh, fluorescent angiography along with endocyanin green angiography was done, which revealed presence of inflammation in both the eye, as can be evident here and here, with blocked fluorescence because of the retinal detachment. OCT revealed presence of subretinal fluid and a lumpy bumpy RPE, retinal pigment epithelium with hyperreflective foci. So at this stage, the patient received a diagnosis of Vogue-Koyanagi-Harada syndrome and received pulse intravenous methylprednisolone 
followed by tapering doses of systemic corticosteroid with systemic azathioprine. A one month follow up, patient was symptomatically better, headache and denitus subsided. However, the best correctal visual acuity was maintained at 2080. At this point, the fundus showed something like leopard spot retinopathy in the left eye, and there was persistence of inferior retinal detachment, although the choroidal detachment has subsided. Again, the fundus fluorescein and the endocyanin green was repeated. There was resolution of the inflammation in the right eye, however, there was blocked fluorescence in the left eye persisting along with there is an incre increase in the leopard spot in the left eye. The OCT at this spot although showed a resolution of the subretinal fluid there was this RP folds and hyperreflective foci. At this stage the, history, uh, the uh, diagnosis was revisited and we suspected that this could be a lymphoma and we did a PET CT scan. However, it did not reveal any malignancy. MRI brain and orbin did not relieve, reveal any presence of lymphoma. At this stage, we reverted back to another imaging technique that is ultrasound biomicroscopy and this revealed presence of uveal effusion syndrome. The actual length of the patient was 20.97 and hence the patient was diagnosed as type 3 uveal effusion syndrome and posterior subtenon injection was given. Three months later, the base corrected visual acuity improved to 2030. However, there were persistence of retinal detachment in the left eye in the infer inferior quadrant alone. So story does not end here. Comprehensively, we have to see. So there were systemic challenges as well. At the baseline, patient was something like this. However, in follow-up visit, we can see there was sparsity of the hair, uh, sparsity of the dentition. So this was present in the mother as well, and a genetic counseling was done, which revealed presence of WNT 10 age in abnormality. So what was known before this, that u uveal effusion syndrome in itself is a very rare cause of exudative retinal detachment. In these cases, imaging comes handy. Systemic immunosuppression is not much effective. Familiar cases, only one has been reported. And type 3 is more and more rare. What's new? That it is not idiopathic. WNT10A could be a pa uh, pathology behind it. And the mutations of WNT has been implied in other uh, ectodermal dysplasias. And it uh, interferes with the interaction between the epithelial cells as well as the underlying mesenchymal cells during the embryogenesis. It's found in the tight junction formations that allows the transfer of molecules in culture studies. It has been studied in keratoconus and in age-related macular dis disorders, degenerations and familial exudative vitroretinopathy. Till date, no, uh, none has reported association of WNT10A with uveal effusion syndrome. So our hypothesis is that it might affect the interphotoreceptor matrix or the addition between the RP and the Brooks membrane that predisposes to accumulation of fluid in the various layers of neurosensory retina and through its expression in the intercellular addition molecules and vascular endothelial growth factor. So to conclude, it's an entity of diagnostic challenge and a careful and thorough systemic evaluation is required to clinch the diagnosis. And we have I report the first case of uveal effusion syndrome with WNT10A gene mutation. Thank you. Thank you. Is it, have you really uh, searched for the literature that is the first case of uveal effusion syndrome? Yes, sir. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, so this is since uh, like since the beginning keratoconus and ARMD FEVR, they have also uh, over the years they have uh, been associated with this mutation. We are reporting for the first time. So it can help in uh, like since we saw that systemic immunosuppressions are not effective. So if some specific molecule against this gene could be found, it could help the patient systemically as well as ocular. Steroid won't help. So uh, yeah, that's what. So challenge was that that uh, if you see a subclinical info, uh, improvement with systemic corticosteroids, you have to go for another imaging that is ultrasound biomicroscopy. So that would help uh, to detect any uveal effusion syndrome. Choroidal detachment was present, which is another uh, rare entity. 
to be seen alone in cases of VKH or sympathetic. So if you see CDs, if you see a subclinical uh, response to corticosteroids, then you should do an UBM that could help in diagnosis of uveal effusion syndrome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks all for the nice uh, session. So I think we should wait for the next session to start.